Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Hormonally Speaking. I am really, really excited. I mean, you guys know I love doing this podcast and all the amazing people that I get a chance to speak with. But this week, I'm speaking with somebody that I think has been essential in changing the narrative around things that are particularly important for women today. And that is how we give birth and then how we take care of our reproductive system and the choices that we have around that. And her name is Abby Epstein, and she made her film directing debut at the 2004 Sundance Film Festival with the documentary V-Day, Until the Violence Stops, featuring Jane Fonda, Selma Hayek, and Rosie Perez. The film won an audience award at Vancouver's Amnesty International Film Festival and premiered on Lifetime Television receiving both an Emmy and a Gracie Allen Award. In 2007, she teamed up with Ricky Lake for their widely acclaimed documentary, The Business of Being Born, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and was released by New Line Cinema, Netflix, and broadcast on Showtime. The film's success led to their follow-up series, More Business of Being Born, featuring Cindy Crawford, Alanis Morissette, Giselle Bündchen, and Christy Turlington, plus a book, Your Best Birth, published by Hatchet. Next, the duo teamed up for the Weed the People, which premiered at the 2018 Southwest uh, SXSW Film Festival and won the Audience Award at the Nashville Film Festival. Weed the People was acquired by Netflix for distribution. In April 2022, they released The Business of Birth Control, which premiered at the DOC NYC and had played at Sheffield Doc Fest and Human Rights Film Festival Berlin. It opened at IFC Theaters in New York City. Under their company, B.O.B.B. Films, Miss Epstein and Miss Lake produced the documentaries Breast Milk and The Mama Sherpas. Prior to her film work, Miss Epstein directed Broadway theater, helming national tours and international productions of Rent and the B- Vagina Monologues. Welcome, Abby. Thank you. Happy yes. to be here. Oh, my God. Reading through that bio, you've done so, so much. It's just <laughs> powerful. So much more than I even mentioned before we dove into your bio. So let's start off with, I was wanting to start off with the business of being born, but let's actually backtrack to the vagina monologues, because that is a hugely impactful thing that changed so many lives too. So how did that even come about in the first place? Yeah, it's funny. I was at, I was telling you the 25th anniversary of V-Day last night. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to believe, but yeah, I mean, that really, so for me, that show was kind of my transition from theater to documentary film. Um, so I was direct and that's actually how I met my producing partner, Ricky Lake. Oh, she was in the New York production. Ah. Um, Used to have like three celebrities rotating in the, in the show. And she was in one of my companies and we became friendly that way. Um, And yeah, so I had directed the play off Broadway and did a bunch of the national tours. And I had a production running in Mexico City for 10 years. I mean, the show was, yeah, it was a really crazy hit, um, resonated, I think, with so many. And it's hard to think back, right? But like, we couldn't actually say vagina. Like the New York Times would not print the ads. Right. Crazy, right? How much is, Yeah. So thankfully, some things have changed, right? We still have some to go, of course, but. I know. So yeah, it was a real um, kind of breakthrough, revolutionary, like piece of writing. And it was such an honor to be a part of that. And um, so I had suggested to um, the author that we like should document some of the traveling we were doing and the productions that were going on and and mostly the stories of like sexual assault and abuse um, that we were capturing all over the world and how these um, women were really being transformed and like turning their pain into power. And so that became my first documentary. Wow. <laughs> uh, it was kind of a trial by fire. I just kind of jumped in um, and didn't know much about documentary film. And it was a very steep, uh, hard learning curve. But it's my favorite know, way. <laughs> yeah, we got the film. The film yeah. opened at Sundance, um, was very successful. So yeah, so I've just always really, um, you know, been involved 
in, I guess, kind of like female empowerment through the arts. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one of the interesting things is that in the vagina monologues, you probably don't remember, but like the last monologue of the show is called I Was There in the Room. Mm. And it's when the playwright, um, Eve Ensler, describes being at the birth of her granddaughter. And we used to get a lot of pushback from mm. the midwifery community mm. because they didn't like the monologue. Mm. And they thought, God, you have this whole show empowering vaginas. And then the last monologue, you have this woman and it has these lines like the doctor stitching her up mm. and, you know, very kind of passive. And um, at the time I was so kind of undereducated, you know, I mean, I was mm -hmm. 20, 20, in my twenties. I mean, I wasn't thinking about having mm -hmm. babies and I just thought, oh my God, those midwives are relentless, you know, like <laughs> what do they want from us? Like, why, why do they have so many issues? You know, can't they just see this is just art and she's just like, you know, a witness to a birth and she's Experience, just describing, right? right? But then, um, you know, a couple of years down the line, Ricky asked me, she had had this home birth and she had said to me, you know, we, I really want to do something with this like topic. I don't mm -hmm. know what it is. I don't know if it's a book. I don't know if it's, you know, and I was like, eh, okay. And again, I was like, oh, the midwives, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they're going to come for us, man. <laughs> for us. And, um, I really was like, I just didn't know much about it, Christine. And so she, Ricky gave me um, Ina Mae Gaskin's book, Spiritual Midwifery. She gave me Robbie Davis Floyd's book, um, Birth is an American Rite of Passage. And then she showed me like some home footage of her home birth. And mm -hmm. I swear to you, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think a lot of people experience this when they read Ina Mae's book, but it was like, it was a real awakening for me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand fully, I understand the bodily autonomy intersection with feminism as it had to do with abortion and reproductive rights and abuse and rape. I didn't understand the intersection of bodily autonomy when it had to do with, you know, more positive rituals, right, like, right. you know, childbirth and the menstrual cycle and, you know, hormonal health. Like I really didn't understand that. So making the business of being born was really a journey for me, mm -hmm. you know, into understanding um, why like birth shouldn't just be viewed as like a clinical medical event. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, like if you've seen the film, you know that I ended up getting pregnant during the filming and then my birth and my birth story became part of the movie which was very unplanned and unexpected. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it was a really special film and we're actually having our 15th anniversary this year. And so we've got plans to um, kind of re-release the film and we have some like exciting ideas of like new interviews and new stories and really taking a look at like where birth culture has come right. in the 15 years and where right. it has really failed. So for those that haven't seen that movie, what are some of the big highlights mm -hmm. that you took away from that experience, especially since you ended up going through the experience of having a child while creating this movie? What do you think that you really discovered about our system of birth healthcare? Yeah, I mean, I think the big takeaways from the movie and, and the reason that I think to this day, 15 years later, nothing has replaced the movie and pretty much, um, you know, if you go to a childbirth education class or if you hire a doula, pretty much the first thing they will say is watch, watch this that movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the reason is um, because, you know, the, I really recently saw the movie again in front of an audience and I was kind of shocked by it because mm. it's very brazen. Mm -hmm. um, it's very bold. Like, I'm not sure we could get away with it today. Mm, interesting. Um, 
I, I actually not sure that like, you know, a Netflix would have picked it up kind of thing, because nowadays we are so scared of cancel culture mm -hmm. and we're so scared of like, oh, a big group like doctors being mad at mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the doctors did get mad at us for sure. the movie and we did get did. some negative press, but that didn't stop, you know, um, a network or a movie studio from releasing it and submitting it for Academy Awards and all that. So I think you know, anyway, back to your question, the big takeaway really from the movie is that um, the way that birth evolved, you know, in the United States is it was really taken out of the hands of midwives, mm -hmm. you know, be it black uh, granny midwives in the South mm -hmm. or, you know, be it um, immigrant midwives who come from Europe and, and trained, you know, it was really taken away and taken over by a surgical profession, you know, the um, obstetric profession and moved into the hospital. And I think now it's almost like the system of birth, you know, in the United States um, is something to be very wary about. And um, you really need to be incredibly proactive. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It really is all about um, money and liability. Yeah. And it is really not centered on mother and baby. Right. Um, you can see that in our horrendous mortality rates, our maternal mm -hmm. mortality rates mm -hmm. for black and brown black women. women yeah. Mm -hmm. The highest in the developed world. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, you know, you can also just see that in, um, you know, when I was making the film, I was just shocked, you know, by the, the sheer amount of, of parents and mothers who kind of went in with this trust and this naivete yeah. and just said, well, yeah, I wanted a vaginal birth. And of course, but then, you know, this happened and that happened and then the clock ran out, but then they told me you know, that they needed to start this drug and then that drug had this reaction. So then they said they had to get the baby out quick. So then mm -hmm. we ended up with a C-section. I mean, these were like 80% of the stories. I right. was yeah. And everybody thought their C-section was necessary. You know, everybody really thought that they could just sort of, you know, go in blind mm -hmm. and just trust the system mm -hmm. and they would get the best birth. And that's truly, truly not the case. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, you know, those are really the big takeaways of the movie is just that there are options. Um, if you are one of those people that just, you know, wants to be as numbed out as possible and as disconnected from the experience as possible, and you just want the baby placed in your arms at the end, mm -hmm. and you don't want to go to a childbirth class and you don't want to learn how to, you know, manage labor and then, Great. I mean, right. the film probably has nothing for you, but <laughs> if you, um, you know, have a feeling that birth is a spiritual, emotional, sacred experience and, you know, an, an empowering experience, and you would like to, um, you know, be in the driver's seat, so to say, and really create a supportive birth team, mm -hmm. there are options out there. And yeah. there are many kind of options and it doesn't mean you have to be at home with the midwife. I mean, right. it does focus on a lot of home births, but it also shows a uh, birth center. I was going to say birth centers or, yeah. you know, the in not the as hospital. many as we'd like, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's really, I would say like a lot of the big takeaways, but it's, it's, it's distressing. And I think nowadays, you know, I don't know. I, I think even when we were making the film, it was so controversial yeah. because back then it was sort of controversial to like challenge women's health on any level. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or challenge healthcare. Now it's more accepted. Right. Right. Like right. now we've a lot more. seen um, the disservice and yeah. the under, under service. So, yeah. Well, you know, it's, I talk a lot about this on the podcast because I went through my own experience, not with having a child, but having a reproductive surgery. So I had a fibroid removed, right? First surgery ever. And they unknowingly burned me in three places in my intestines during that surgery. And I landed in the ER with sepsis two weeks later, oh lost my. half my colon, <gasps> ended up 
having an ostomy bag for six and a half months, you know, on and on and on. And the naivety I went with into that situation, you know, and never hearing about this kind of thing happening. And it happens. I mean, I'm a bit of an extreme case, but there are a decent amount of women that do get nicked in their colon or their bladder during a reproductive surgery. And this is not talked about, you know, people are just floored when they hear my, my story. And so it's been a, you know, big thing for me to talk about this and share about this and that this happens kind of in this secretness, you know, because medical malpractice when it comes to these things is really, really, really hard. Cause technically it's in the, you know, the mound of paperwork that they give you that you have to sign your life away. Mm -hmm. And people's lives are sometimes, I was lucky I was able to be reversed and, you know, get rid of my ostomy bag, but there still will be certain situations that I have to deal with for the rest of my life because of that. And there's a lot of other women that aren't as lucky and they do hysterectomies like, like you know, I mean, similar to C-sections, right? It's just like, let's, something's wrong here. Let's just do a hysterectomy. And without taking into consideration so many things, like what the uterus is important for beyond just giving birth, you know? So my goal always is to educate as many women around these issues as possible. And that's why I'm so grateful for you guys putting together these movies, right? Both the business of being born and then your more recent one, the business of birth control, which is certainly mind blowing for so many women because this information about birth control has not been out there, right? <laughs> Until very recently, we haven't been talking about what birth control does to women's bodies. So how did you guys end up deciding to make this movie? Mm. Well, we were making this other movie at the time called Weed the People, mm -hmm. um, kind of a different wheelhouse about yeah. medical cannabis yeah. and children with cancer. Mm. And um, I was sent a book called Sweetening the Pill mm -hmm. by Holly Griggs Ball. And Holly had sent me like unpublished manuscripts, you know, kind of galleys, like the book hadn't been out yet. And she said that she was a big fan of the business of being born. And she could really see this as like a documentary, you know, potentially. And she'd been trying to get it off the ground and mm -hmm. hadn't really gone anywhere. So I remember I was on a flight from New York where I live to LA where Ricky lives. And on that flight, I read the book, Sweetening the Pill. And I swear when I landed, I like got to Ricky's house and I just said, I, I, I mean, I think this is our next movie. Mm. I went, wow. I was blown away by the book. Um, I had so many like personal epiphanies about my own hormonal contraceptive use in my life, you know, reading the book mm -hmm. and covering things. And I just said to Ricky, this is going to be really tough. Nobody really wants to hear this, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like we've been out there before we've taken the slings and arrows, you know, and like, I just feel as a service, you know, to the next generation we need to make this documentary because nothing is going to change in the hormonal contraceptive landscape if there's no push, right? right? If right. there's no demand for, for different options and options for men. So that was that. And, you know, it was, it was really totally interesting, Christine, because we were, as I said, in the middle of another movie. And usually when you start a movie, it, it just takes so long to get to that first day when you pick up a camera mm. there's so much fundraising and mm. planning and Ugh. it's very hard to raise funds for independent film I very bet. i bet and um something about this movie like you the universe was just funneling the budget to us oh it wow was, it was very bizarre surprising like, <laughs> yeah it was kind of like oh well let's do a kickstarter and then we did this Kickstarter and we could see right away, we got 2000 backers and, you know, raised a lot of the budget on Kickstarter. And we could see from just the Kickstarter community, like how many people 
mm-hmm. were desperate for a movie like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there was big support and there was support from um, one of the families who lost their 24 year old daughter um, to uh, a pulmonary embolism, which was caused by the NuvaRing device. Mm-hmm. So we had families, a bunch of families who, you know, lost daughters and they really wanted to see the movie happen. So there was kind of like a lot of impetus that, you know, fundraising wise right. um, for people who wanted this message out there. And so, um, yeah, we did it. And it was, it was in a way that was like probably the most difficult like filmmaking journey I've ever had because mm. um, we kind of had finished the movie ish like right when the pandemic broke out and so mm, of course. we were sort of <laughs> stuck yeah and kind of had to wait for a year and then hell of timing right <laughs> it was really like I know I wish it had been finished and able to be like released during the pandemic right. I think that would have been perfect um and then we had the terrible misfortune of having the movie premiere last April and then having Roe v. Wade overturned in June. Right. So then it became even like more hostile because mm-hmm. nobody wants to talk about, right? The downsides yeah. of birth control when right. abortion has been taken off the menu. Right. So right. it has been very challenging and people are incredibly reactive to this topic. Um, it's very polarizing. Either people are like, you know, thank you. Thank you for validating my experience. You know, thank you for sharing this. Or, you know, I would say there's more like liberal progressive feminists that are coming at us saying, aren't you just feeding into the right wing narrative? Right. right? Yeah. Or so it's like, you know, it's such, it's like this black and white thing. Right. And so nobody can see this middle ground and that we need more options. Right. right. I I mean, it's, yeah, I can only imagine that happening around Roe v. Wade and, you know, just all of, all of the polarizing issues around that and, and how deeply that is a part of the divide in this country. And so, so many women are just like, well, what is my, what is my choice here? You know, I've got to take birth control, you know, Although we know a good chunk of women that do take birth control, they are not necessarily taking it for birth control purposes, right? They're taking it for the horrible periods they have, for the acne, for all of these things. And these pills are being handed out to 15 and 16 year olds, right? When their reproductive system hasn't even come completely online yet. And so, you know, that's, that's for me a, a topic. I, you know, I think it, it's so overwhelming to think about, okay, so how to do we keep women um, being able to plan their lives by not having to have babies when they don't want to have babies, but also protect their health for the long term? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I can imagine some of this was what came up in the movie and everything too. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, I mean, Absolutely. And I think that, you know, it is, it's very divisive. It's very black and white. I think that, you know, we also are, I would say at a moment in not only feminism, Mm -hmm. if that word even still has any, (laughs) if you can even say it anymore, (laughs) I don't know what it means. I think for Gen Z, it's like a negative thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it depends on who you talk to. It's like, we're getting back and forth, right? We are, but I (laughs) think like, I also think we're at a particular moment where, and I'm sure, you know, we've been there before, but right now I find there's a big um, generational divide around this topic. Yeah. So it's quite extreme. And we felt that, especially when we were trying to like sell the movie for distribution. Mm -hmm. If there was like a young female executive you know, in the room, like either in, you know, her late twenties, early Mm -hmm. thirties, she immediately got this movie said, all my friends are talking about this. 
None of us want to be on the pill. Yeah. This is the most important movie I think of at all of my generation. Mm. And then you would have maybe the like, you know, over 40 or 50 year olds in the room that were like, well, I mean, you know, we fought so hard right. for right. birth control and, you know, it's really like, how can we sort of like shoot this gift horse in the foot? And so I just, I found that also extremely interesting. And yeah. a lot of like mother daughters, right. Are like mm-hmm. caught the divide. Mm-hmm. So as you were just saying about like putting, let's say a 15 year old on birth control, it's interesting. We did a screening last month for Australia and New Zealand. Mm-hmm. We had an amazing conversation afterward with, um, Dr. Laura Bryden and Dr. Peter Wright and Lucy Peach. And, you know, Dr. Peter Wright is a gynecologist um, and she, as a practice, feels very strongly about not putting a young teenager with a developing menstrual cycle on birth control, Mm -hmm. you know, and she had a lot of great metaphors, <laughs> you know, for what that is actually doing. Like yeah. she said, it's like, you know, if, if I think she said something about like, almost like if your reproductive system is a piano and you're like learning to play, mm-hmm. you know, you're figuring mm-hmm. out the chords. It's like, you don't then just like put it on like player piano speed. You know what right. I mean? It's just like automatically playing for you. Right. right. So um, I thought that was so fascinating because you know, your hormonal experience can be really affected by the philosophy of the physician or the practitioner or the midwife you choose, you know? And I think people don't realize that they're very trusting of doctors and, um, you know, so there are all these kind of different beliefs floating around and it makes it really hard for people to land on like, what's, you know, healthy, what's not healthy. And, you know, I think the other really confusing thing, Christine, is that we're in this age of the influencer right now, yeah. we're in this age of the guru, right? Yeah. Deep in it. Yep. Deep in it. <laughs> Deep in it. And I mean, you know, we've got these podcasts of people drink their urine every day. And we've got, <laughs> right. Like we've got all like wars over plant-based diet. Yes. And diet. Yep. And what, you know, and it's really hard. And, and a lot of these people are selling snake oil. I don't want exactly. to say all of them, right. but a lot of them yes. are vested in some way financially, right? In the product. In, yep. In the product, and what they're preaching. Yep. So it was really hard in the movie, you know, to even find like experts who like would sort of speak out against the status quo, Mm -hmm. but, you know, we're MDs or, you know, we're kind of like professionally trained people that, you know, I mean, some of them, there's just like a blur right now, you know, like Mm -hmm. I had an interview with somebody and she said, well, why do you have so many influencers in the film? Mm -hmm. And I was like, God, you know, really? So like, you think like, Dr. Sarah Gottfried is an influencer. influencer. And I was thinking like, I don't know, what's the line? Is right, she, right. cause she does sell a hormone treatment plan that right, you see, right. like she does market. And you, you see her, you know, on social media and in these different yes. places. So people can qualify somebody as being that. An influencer. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, okay, wow. Cause I thought she was like a Harvard trained yeah. physician yeah. and I, believe that she is really very, very bright. And, yes. you know, I, so, so to me that that's also a slippery slope because everybody is sort of thinking, oh, you're giving this like faux science, mm-hmm. kind of like goopified. Right. Yeah, right. But I think the, the, the problem with that theory, let's say for our film, right. Yeah. Is that a, we're not making a dime on the movie. Right. In fact, we, I mean, if you want to say we lost money on the movie, right, because right. we had to raise all this money to make it, and you don't make a dime. Yeah. So we're not making money on the movie. We're not selling anything. Yeah. We don't have an agenda, and we're not right wing conservative, you know, Catholics. Like we don't have a f- ideological agenda. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you know, it makes it kind of hard and. And I think that when we premiered the movie in Europe and when we've done screenings in Berlin and London, 
for whatever reason, again, I'll use the F word feminism is in a more evolved place over there, I would say, where they understand that there can be a liberal critique of the mm-hmm. poem. Mm-hmm. And I found that when we showed the movie, a lot of the talk back was kind of really based on solutions. Like, mm-hmm. okay, but you know, well, what should we do? Because like, I'm doing fertility awareness and a lot of my friends are doing it, but then I have a lot of friends who fell pregnant doing mm-hmm, it. So mm-hmm. what do we do? Because, you know, it's hard to do. And like, it was, it, it wasn't, there were no politics involved. Right. There was no pushback of like, this is so dangerous. Yeah. The message you're yeah. sending, you know? So I find um, like, that's another piece that just makes all of this very tricky. Well, and I I can see that in America, right? Because we are so polarizing that at this point, in very few things are people talking about solutions, right? Literally what we need to be doing in everything is talking about possible solutions. And what people are doing is digging their heels in on whatever side that they are and calling the opposite side, the devil, you know, trying to take over the world. And, And so- I mean, we're just stuck in a lot of muck right now, right? In so many different areas. So certainly anything around women's bodies is going to like be ratcheted up to here. And, you know, it is, I'd certainly, you know, I will come out here on the podcast as a liberal, you know, I consider myself a liberal and understanding that we have to evolve, right? Like, thank God for birth control being developed, And giving so many women choices for the first time, really, you know, I mean, for the first time, let's say in modern history, I think there was a lot of, you know, uh, knowledge that women had for centuries before to to inhibit getting pregnant that that we lost along the way, but in modern times, but why do we want to just stay there, right? Why don't we, now that we have this deeper information, and this is true for most medications, right? You don't know within even the first few years necessarily how they're going to impact our bodies for the long term. We know even less around women's bodies because science has decided to just start actually really studying women's bodies within the past decade or so, right? Because our hormones made it hard for them supposedly to be able to truly research us. So now that we have this information, let's say, what is the next level? What are we going to evolve to? You know, how are, as you mentioned, bring in men into the picture? How are we going to come up with things that don't completely shut down our own hormones and all the implications with that? And yet still be able to protect us if we do not want to have kids, you know, and, and I love fam, but you know, that can't be the only solution too. I get it. You know, it doesn't work for everyone. Nope. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, the conversation is, I just, a friend sent me an article in the New York times today um, about, you know, women being misled mm-hmm. for, around menopause. Mm-hmm. So I was reading the article this morning and I, you know, it's, it's another thing that just fascinates me. Right. Because it's like, okay, so you get to this part of your hormonal journey, you're kind of like misinformed and misled from like menstruation through, right. Pause. And then even within the menopause world, you know, I just am kind of shocked that I live in New York city And I have friends getting absolutely polar opposite advice Mm -hmm. from their gynecologists. In terms of like hormone replacement therapy? Is that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like I have a friend whose doctor is saying, you know, just put up with the hot flashes, put up with all of it because it, trust me, it is way better than um, doing hormone uh, replacement therapy. I still think it's dangerous. It increases cancer risk, blah, blah, blah. Then you, I have other friend and you know, her doctor saying the exact opposite, yeah. right? Yep. Get on this stuff during this very specific window before right. you're too old, this is going to really like change your quality of life. And I, so I think that if you look at something with perimenopause and menopause, there are two categories of women, yeah. right? Yeah. Like there's women, I'll put myself in this category and I'm assuming because my mother was similar, 
like I haven't had any, any mm. peri perimenopausal, some, you know, oh, since, or, yeah. I mean, you know, everything that's happened to me is like par for the course, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like changes in your cycle, things that you're expected and are yeah. abs everything with me is absolutely manageable and not negative. Um, and then I have friends who couldn't get out of bed. Right. So the anxiety <laughs> levels, right. That some women end up experiencing and the energy and, levels yeah. Yeah. and the, you know, drop in their hormones. And again, like, you know, we're at a place now where, I mean, rates of fertility just in general, right. The amount of assisted reproductive technology that's mm -hmm. happening, right. Mm -hmm. Like so many people conceiving in IVF and being on, you know, hormones for however many years. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know what that's doing to their menopause. We don't know right. what being on the pill for 20 years does to your menopause. So we're sort of like an experimental, right? hundred percent. Yeah. Generation. So, uh, you know, I think that that's, um, it's the same place we are, I think with cycles, with birth control, with menopause, it's like, we're just in this very like dark, confusing space mm -hmm. where they're saying this study was valid. Oh no, it wasn't valid. Ignore that study. Right. You know, <laughs> we're doing this study. and like, and it's it's just it's just impossible to even yeah. understand data. Like yeah. something that's supposed to be right. Like I think we're seeing the limitations right around. I mean science is so important. Studies are so important. Data is so important. And there's limitations around them too, right? Plus mm -hmm. it comes down so much to the bio-individuality of yes. each person too, right? Which we don't as a healthcare system mm -hmm. take into account at all. It's, That's we right. do this across the board, right? This is, That's if this right. is going on, we're going to give you this pill. And, yeah. you know, simply, you know, my goal certainly is to educate women on just what their hormones are supposed to be doing each month, you know, and understanding yeah. the process that their body goes through so that they can start to understand when something goes off, you That's know, right. and be empowered in that place. Because unfortunately, so many of their doctors don't even understand. <laughs> no, they don't. And also, you know, I feel on some level, like, you know, what is wrong with anecdata? Right. Like we're right. getting attacked Yep. that our film has too much anecdata. And it's mm -hmm. like, I find it really funny that there's this one little piece of the film that a lot of people harp, harp on, which is <laughs> this, you know, I'm sure you've seen it. It's been like kind of, it's been like actually on a lot of like, I think wellness podcasts and and talks, but it has to do with like hormones and pheromones of attraction, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, how right. Hormonal right. birth control affects how you are able to receive and detect the pheromones of a potential need. Okay. So, you know, again, this goes back to this question of like, how much research is enough research and what research is, you know, accepted. Yep. And, and I had a kind of very robust debate with a journalist recently. And she said, well, why would you have included that in the documentary? Mm. And that's like, so clearly kind of junk science and this and that. And I said, well, did you read Dr. Sarah Hill's book? This is your brain on birth control. Cause she actually does a great job of like mm -hmm. putting all the pheromone studies, you know, together mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. And this reporter said to me, yeah, but one of those studies had like 1200 people in it. I mean, come on, she, right. and so, you know, the studies weren't good enough for her. Right. So I said, okay. I said, I respect that. And I said, but I'm going to tell you that this pheromone side effect, you know, happened to me mm. and it happened to many, many women that I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's enough for me. Yeah. Cuz yeah. You know what? It's like if there've been some studies that have shown, you know, maybe they're not double blind, right. placebo controlled, but you know, they're certainly not junk science. Yeah. And again, there's certainly not studies that are funded by pharmaceuticals right. or funded by, you know, they're independent studies. And and that's, you know, it, even it blows my mind, Christine. It blows my mind to this day 
that when people write about the link between hormonal birth control and depression and anxiety, something that has been honestly at this point, really, really conclusively and exhaustively detailed Mm -hmm. in a study, a Danish study of over 1 million women. Right. Right. And that they will still write, you know, in an article, um, you know, oh, there is inconclusive research. Right. It infuriates me. (laughs) It infuriates me because anecdata on that alone. Right. Right. Well, and even the journalist saying to you, there's no research backing this up. And then you say, actually there is. And she says, oh, that's not real research. You know, what, where do we draw the line here? You know, I mean, going back to the fact that we have not researched women's bodies for very long. So A, you're not going to have a lot of studies. The ones that, you know, unfortunately are going to come out are often influenced by the pharmaceutical industry, just like generally across the board these days, you know? So at what point, I mean, we have to understand that anecdotal evidence is hugely impactful too, and that we're not going to get everything that we want from scientific studies, right? And and it doesn't mean that we, I mean, it drives me insane when simple things, I'll just say like vaginal staining, for instance, right? Because that's a that's a that's a big issue, right? Because right. supposedly, like you know, Gwyneth Paltrow brought it to people, but do you know who Steamy Chick is? No. Oh, so she's this amazing woman, black woman that actually before it came out via Gwyneth, right? She was going um, and doing research around the whole oh. world. And how vaginal steaming has been used. I mean, she has, I think it's still on her website. She has links to everywhere in the world where it's shown up in different texts and all that stuff, you know, and it drives me crazy, right? Because everybody focuses on the Gwyneth Paltrow goopness of it rather than this thing that A, very rarely is going to cause any damage. And B, there's lots of evidence that has been used for thousands and thousands of years and that it's been truly beneficial for women, you know, and, and we had to just be busy tearing it down, right. <laughs> Instead of being like, Oh, this can be helpful. And actually I was just reading, I think the other day, they are now doing in the Czech Republic because of the work that um, steaming chick has done. They, uh, and there was somebody that did a training from her. I think that was in the Czech Republic and brought it, maybe a nurse that brought it to the hospitals there. And they are doing it 80% of the time for women giving birth now because it helps with the birthing process. Right. And so this is what we do is we take these things and we get in back to the influencer culture, right? It's not real. It's not good. It's woo woo. If it's been talked about by this influencer. And I'm like, can we yes. get away from that and look underneath and think about these things yeah. that can support women's bodies, particularly that have been around for so long, we've gotten rid of so much of that wisdom. And if we're able to come back to that, you know, a lot of these things will be a whole lot easier. Even talk about the menopause part, right? If you look at some traditional cultures, their transition into menopause is much, 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 much easier in general mm-hmm. than ours in the West. Why is that? Right. Because, I mean, there's probably tons of reasons, but the sort of stressful life, the views around it. Right. In a lot of these traditional cultures, getting older as a woman is seen as a good thing. You become the wise elder. Right. And here we become go to the corner and be quiet, you know, situation. And so. Yeah, it just, it drives me absolutely crazy when we have to just jump on and tear down these things instead of saying, what can we learn from the situation? That's right. And I get it. Like, I understand that there is like, you know, this kind of knee jerk, like reaction. And I, I get that. And I think, you know, with the Gwyneth Paltrow vaginal steaming thing, Again, I really think that, you know, she's somebody who's like laughing all the way to the bank. Sure. Right. So it's like, I think because her brand is so much about selling women things they don't need. Right. Um, I thought that was brilliant though, like the vagina candle and like all this. this, (laughs) this Great marketing, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> and just the spoofy stuff they did, like yeah. the, the G diapers that are like, <laughs> oh, I didn't even hear about those. <laughs> oh yeah. Like they did a fake product. Like oh, that's like so funny. Scoop diapers with gold pins and <laughs> you know, a hundred dollars a day for delivery. Like something. So obscure. they were making fun of themselves, essentially. They're making yeah. fun of themselves, which I love, but I just think that that listen, underneath it all, you know, I respect what Gwyneth is doing. And I res you know, even if it is in in profit based, it's kind of like it's okay. Um I I do think like it goes back to like the beginning of our conversation, right? It's like maybe vaginal steaming is something that, you know, was lost. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the same thing with midwifery, with mm -hmm. postpartum traditions. Mm -hmm. I don't, God knows what kind of perimenopause and menopause traditions and, right. you know, kind of like um, other kind of solutions potentially might have been, you know, lost mm -hmm. in this in this like generations of thinking, um, you know, we know better than our ancestors. Right. And it's really, you know, like there are kind of, you know, look, women have been, women's bodies haven't changed. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, there's, there are always going to be these things. It's like, you know, I love like B Dixon, the founder of Honeypot company. And like, she talks about how this kind of remedy that she came up with for um, BV, mm -hmm. sexual vaginosis, literally came to her in a dream from mm. her grandmother. Oh, I've never heard that. Yeah, she, it was an ancestor. And I think it was an ancestor that she'd never met. And B was struggling, you know, with BV. Yeah. And she had a dream. And her yeah. ancestor gave her this, you know, formula. Yep. And she ended up bottling it and selling it at small, you know, health fairs. And mm -hmm. now she's got this like huge company. I yeah. love it. But it's like, okay, like I believe that because yeah. I believe like, you know, that we have to kind of, you know, at this point, I would say, you know, modern science has failed yeah. um, women, yeah. has failed us. And we talk about this in documentary, but we're sicker than we've ever been. Yep. You know, we have poor menstrual health. We have poor body literacy. We have incredibly high rates of endometriosis, PCOS, yes. fibroids, um, anxiety, depression through the roof. Mm -hmm. So, you know, look at all this. This is how we got here, yep. right? Yep. So, I mean, it's kind of like, it is time to sort of either go back to the ancestors or like reinvent the wheel right. or put some of this burden as far as contraception goes on people with penises. <laughs> yeah. Like it's time. It is know? time. Absolutely. To shift. And, and, and I think that, you know, that's another thing that I think I've seen with releasing this movie mm -hmm. you know, is that this younger generation, Gen Z, whatever you want to call them, they are ready to embrace this message. They get it. Yep, absolutely. And I love the anecdote that you just shared about the honeypot founder because I, so I have a friend that works at IONS. I don't know if you've heard of that Institute for Noetic Sciences. And she was in a training where they talked about, you know, the, the five senses, but when we talk about the sixth sense, that's sort of our intuitive sense. And they said, our first sense was actually this intuitive sense, right? And if you think about it, humans before, you know, communication existed before we were, you know, um, sharing things in, in the ways that we do now, we had to rely on our intuition to stay alive, to be able to run from that, you know, saber tooth tiger, et cetera. And that's something that we've kind of lost or dampened along the way. Right. And, and I think this is a part of not every woman or cycling person's, you know, uh, power, I don't want to say, but for some of us that there's such deep power in there that's I feel like is welling up right now, right? Particularly when it comes to our health. And so tapping into that, I just, that's why I think that story is so beautiful, right? Because not just because it ended up being a successful thing, mm -hmm. but because when we tune into that part of ourselves, it can really guide us, yeah. especially in that bio-individuality that we're talking about, right? Like, I mean, I'm like, ancestors come, <laughs> tell me what's up. <laughs> tell me what to do. I like it. Yeah. 
So um, let me ask you one controversial question before we close out. Um, I'm assuming Dr. Jen Gunther has been, um, has had some things to say about possibly the movie and, and everything. Oh, yeah, that's not controversial. Okay. <laughs> oh no, that's not controversial. It's funny because Jen Gunther, um, when we were premiering in San Francisco, one of our producers was pretty good friends with her. Okay. So we sent Jen an invite mm-hmm. to the opening night in San Francisco and we sent her a link to the movie and we actually invited her to come mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. speak. You know, yeah. because oh, the, well. point, the point of the movie is um, not for us to be the final authority on everything. Right. The point of the movie is to open conversation, mm-hmm. you know, and I always say that every time we have a talk back panel with the movie, I'm like, you do not have to agree mm-hmm. with this mm-hmm. entire film. Mm-hmm. You can agree with parts of the film and you can take issue with parts of the film. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, so anyway, I thought it was funny. So Jen Gunter, she wrote back to our mutual friend that she couldn't come because she'd be too angry. And <laughs> she hadn't seen the film yet. <laughs> She's like, I already know. <laughs> I already know I'm gonna hate this. <laughs> um oh, and funny. so yeah, I know she 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 was upset like we were on Jamila Jamil's podcast mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, Jamila loved the movie. Oh, and I she, bet. I bet. Yeah. She posted some really emphatic quotes about it on Twitter right before she left Twitter. And so um, Jen has, Jen Gunter has like some cronies. And I think they love mm. to be that kind yeah. of attacking like Twitter mob. Yeah. So they kind of jumped on like Jamila's. So I, I we knew she was, you know, but we knew she still the movie. Mm hmm. She still see the movie. So then I think I didn't read what she posted, but I know she posted some kind of blog or something on her like blog post. And it's kind of funny, right? Because um, we actually had another OBG, right? OBGYN write a response to Jen's uh, piece. Oh, okay. And we haven't published it yet, but we will. Okay. And sure. I think it's kind of funny because I, again, I don't, I can't like read all this stuff, but I didn't read everything, you know, Dr. Gunter wrote, but I thought it was interesting that in her kind of online persona, she seems to have this community and this is very typical of like what social media has done to us. And especially around women's health, where all these communities are very like insular Mm-hmm. and kind of like self-confirming mm-hmm. so you know and rabid <laughs> yeah and so like like but basically all the comments on her thread was sort of like how irresponsible how dare they you know have this documentary without the proper research represented or whatever and it was like these are all people who've never seen the movie of course you know the course. same thing happened to us on the business of being born it was the same thing you know, it was mm-hmm. like, you're killing babies and home birth kills babies. And like, no one had seen the film. So it's just, it's interesting that it, it's almost like, I feel like with Gunder, it's like, you know, she attacks people to raise her own, you know, yes. public profile, which is how, she, you know, I think why she attacked Gwyneth Paltrow mm-hmm. and got a lot of press over that, yes. you know, hundred percent. Mm-hmm. And don't forget again, Jen Gunter selling books. Yes. So she's pointing at all these other people saying they're influencers and they're charlatans, but she's selling books. She's going on podcasts. You know, I have another hundred percent agree. <laughs> yeah. I have another good friend, a doctor, Dr. Um, Gilbert Lenz. She just wrote a book called uh, Menopause Boot Camp. Mm-hmm. We did a, me- a thing with with her and we were like, oh, watch out. We're in Gunter territory. She's going <laughs> to come for you, you know? And, um, you know, what we've heard from other, and she did, by the way, of course. And then what we've heard from other female OBGYNs, which is really sad, is that most of them secretly abhor um, yeah. Jen Gunter's style and yeah. her online bullying and the way she goes after people, but they don't want to speak up against her right. because they don't want to deal with the trolling. Yep. Yep. A hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. And it- But anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't like affect us because, you know, if you, you know, you were like, not kind of, I guess, like 
for everyone. And we're not trying to convince anybody. Right. Like that's the thing. Right. The movies on our, both our movies, you know, we're not trying to convince you to have a home birth. We're not trying to convince you to go off the pill. We're just trying to like get women to deeply understand and be informed and have informed consent around medications and procedures and make choices. And we're not trying to like demonize any of those choices and like whatever, if you're on a particular birth control that works for you and you feel great on it. I mean, you know, we are not ideological in that way. So it's, that's why I think it's like, it's funny to me because, um, you know, none of it, none of the, the controversy for what it's worth, you know, it, it only sort of helps us, right. way, you yeah. know, because then people are That's like, it. Yep. Mm-hmm. like, what she's so mad about, you know? Yep. And, yep. Um, and also yep. I think women see through things now, like there was one kind of snarky review that was posted in some magazine. And I saw on the Instagram thread that in the comments, all the top comments were like, alert, pharma sponsored, pharma sponsored, you know, article. So women are seeing through the fact that, you know, a magazine is taking a certain point of view towards the film because they're all supported by, you know, pharma ads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So everyone's, you know, seeing that, I think, seeing through that now. Yeah. It's such a crazy mixed up labyrinth of all of it right (laughs) and it goes back again to these sort of two sides that we're just on these extremes and trying to win out you know but but it's like the controversy is helpful too to get the message out there and you know I mean I just think about in my small little you know, world in terms of the women that I work with, I always think of it as I'm just planting a seed, right? They may or may not run with it now. They may or may not run with it five years down the road, but maybe 10 years down the road, that kind of comes back and they recognize things in a different way, right? And that's really what education is all about. That's what informed consent is all about. So um, yeah, so it's an incredible, incredible thing that you guys have done to put these movies together. Let everybody know how they can actually see them, both Business of Being Born and Business yeah. of Birth Control. Well, they're um, they're up on Amazon. So okay. they're Amazon, um, US, UK, and Germany. Okay. And otherwise, the easiest thing is you can also just link out and see them on our website. Okay. And our website is um, either you can just go to the business of birth mm-hmm. super easy, the business of being born.com, um, or our Instagram, which is at business of birth control. Perfect. And, and you can- mm-hmm. I know for a little while you, um, people were hosting uh, viewings of it. Is that an option for people to do too? Yes. yes. And okay. we are going to do um, like a big screening event for International Women's Day on March 8th, for example. Oh, cool. So you can host your own virtual screening. Cool. Um, you can host your own, you know, in-person screening. We have one coming up in San Diego in a few weeks. So yes, um, the film is out there to be like a grassroots tool and a learning tool. And we've also started something new on our website um, which is super exciting for both for just like consumers, but also like for practitioners like yourself, we started something called um, the business of film circle. Mm. So, you know, we have 10 films um, and instead of kind of renting them all like individually and having 48 hours to watch them, mm-hmm. we have this membership now where you just pay one kind of lifetime access membership fee. Mm -hmm. So it's a one-time fee and you basically then get lifetime access to our entire library of not only all our film, but every month we have conversations and we archive those on the website. And as it is, we have like, I think over 40 hours of different like classes and courses we have a six-part body literacy course 
you know, aimed at like figuring out the right birth control. So it's, mm. it's kind of a cool thing because you opens you up to like this right. sort of university of education and films. So that's our film circle that's membership. Amazing. That- I, I love that idea. That's so helpful for so many practitioners that are really trying to learn, right? And we, you don't yeah. always know where to get the information. So we'll put links to all of that in the show notes so people can get directly there. Abby, thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing all of your wisdom and all the work that you've done is incredible. And I'm so excited for those that haven't seen the film um, to see the film. And I I live in Asheville and I want to try and do a screening here at some point. So that's why I was like, let me check in about the screening situation. So oh, yeah. it'd be great there. Yeah, We've yeah, been- absolutely. A hundred percent. And I know exactly where I want to do it. So hey. yeah. All right. Well, thanks again for being here Thank with us today. Too. And thanks everybody. I will see you next week.